Good morning, everyone. Having a good morning? What is it with the politicians? They want to keep talking about the labor market, right? That is a success. Well done, everybody here. Uh, so we've had the politicians talking about the labor market. Uh, what about hearing from business about the labor market? And who better uh, than Sandra? Sandra Henke, who's the global head of people and culture at Hayes. By the way, anybody here from Hayes? Give us a bit of a wave. The Hayes crowd are out in force. Uh, they've been here the last two days. If you get a chance to talk to them uh, around the coffee table, please do. Welcome. Thank you. What a pleasure to be here. How Thank great you. of you to be here. I'm just going to ask you a very simple question to begin with. Uh, what's going on in the labor market? <laughs> I mean, it's just everything's going on. What, what, are you, what are you seeing? What am I seeing? So um, shall, we, shall we start by perhaps doing a little comparison with my, what might be going on in the rest of the world? Oh, please. So whilst we know that some of our neighbours and countries further afield are faring a little better than the UK uh, against some economic indicators at the moment, the skill shortage that we've been hearing so much about today and yesterday is a global challenge. It is not unique to the UK. If we take a look at unemployment, for example, if we look at our neighbours, Germany, the Netherlands, yeah. Ireland, Poland, roughly in line with the UK, slightly under 5%. We go further afield to Australia at 3.5% unemployment, to the US at 37 So this war for talent, this competition, is universally felt right now. Uh, and that you know, we also know that supply does not meet demand. We've heard enough about that. So what we're seeing is those countries and those economies that are applying real skills uh, training policy and loosening their migration are stealing a march. A really interesting example for me is Singapore. Uh, Singapore is facing a declining population, a rapidly aging population, and tightened its migration policies, interestingly, before COVID. That's all changing uh, in line with the rest of the world now. But in 2014, Singapore decided to place all of its bets raising productivity through upskilling. Uh, a program called Skill Future, it's a really interesting program if anyone's interested to go and look at it. And that is a government aggregated accredited program specifically aimed at over 25s in the workplace. In fact, uh, credits, subsidised credits for upskilling in tech and business management, and those credits increase for the over 50s. So they place their bets on totally upskilling the existing workforce, and around 25% of Singaporean workers have taken that up. I think it's wow. a really interesting approach and pragmatic approach for us to take a look at. Yeah. When and not necessarily what we're doing. Not necessarily what's not happening necessarily here. What doing, yeah. No, that's right. So tell me, uh, we've dealt with the whole sort of analysis of the market. It's sort of comforting, I guess, to think that other countries have got the same challenges. Mm. But it also makes you think, as a business owner, business leader, gosh, can I solve this? Right. So, so what are the best businesses doing, big or small, what are they doing to solve this? Because essentially, we're all competing for a smaller pool of people, aren't we? We are. So there's lots to talk about, Tony. There are lots of great things to do. Let's start with this notion of an employee value proposition, if we start there, uh, which is essentially two things. One is the deal we strike with employees to make it attractive to come and work for us and stay working for us. And let's be honest, regardless of the conditions in which we operate, we need the right talented people to help us to execute our ambitions, our goals, our targets. That doesn't change. And regardless of the market conditions, good people, talented people have choice. So we are competing regardless of how, how tough the backdrop might be. So let's take a look at what story we are telling prospective employees about coming to work for us. And there's a lot in our control here. There's a lot to be optimistic about right now. Okay. Let's break that down into three or four buckets. The first is organizational. And this requires all of us to ask some existential questions about the company we are working with and to reset, recalibrate what that experience is like for people post-pandemic. If, if we haven't reset our deal that we're striking with employees today, then we're doing something wrong. Can I just do a quick poll? Quick poll, hands up in the audience if you've done work on resetting the employee deal or value proposition in the last year. In the last year? Yeah, most Fantastic. of the audience. Fantastic, Most Great. of the audience. 
So tell us what a good one looks like. Organisation. So, let's start with the organisation. Who are we? What's our purpose? You know, all these big existential questions. What do we stand for? Do we do the right thing? And getting as honest with ourselves as possible. Uh, our surveys are telling us that 85% of the 13,000 people we surveyed in our salary guide want to know what an organisation stands for, and it's a considerable factor in their decision-making about 85%. which role to take. Yeah. We'll, we'll get more into social purpose in a moment, but who are you organisationally? Where do you sit in your market and industry? What is your brand perception to people who might be considering coming to work? If you get some honest data on that, what do people really think about you when they see you advertising for a role? Um, and then in amongst that organisational piece, what's your pay and reward? And I appreciate there's an awful lot of pressure on that right now. But there are ways to make yourself more competitive in the rewards, reward space. Balance, flexibility, incentives, awards, recognition, subsidised, whatever it might be. Do you mind be. me asking you just a quick question sure. about that? Uh, am I being overly cynical in saying, uh, in the end, base pay is what counts? So yeah, the I only th thing that counts. I think every individual human being has their own career equation. Right? We're all unique. We all have different sets of motivators. I work with people who are very motivated by different things to me. Uh, and that changes, obviously, as we all know, depending on our life stage and the challenges we've got available to us. For some, having more time available becomes important yeah, yeah. for a certain period of time. Yeah. So, first of all, we're all motivated by completely different things. Yep. And we're seeing a trend towards greater customization of understanding that. So, uh, in my early years uh, in the workforce, we relied heavily on HR policy to guide that equation. These are the hours people are in the office. This is the dress code. If I can see you, I know you're working hard. <laughs> it's nice and fair. It's nice and consistent. And as a boss, I don't have to make too many of those decisions. But this trend towards customization is very real uh, and isn't going away. I need you to talk to me about what I need in terms of hours and flexibility. I need you to talk to me about what I need and perhaps how my pay is structured. I need you to talk to me more about the learning that I specifically need for this stage of my career. So that requires far greater managerial and leadership capability because the HR policy doesn't take care of everything anymore. Hmm. We have to have conversations, we have to build trust, we have to have rapport, we have to have understanding. And do you mind me asking you, uh, asking for a friend who's another 50-year-old boss, uh, this customization. It seems like a complete nightmare for the employer, right? Yeah. How can I do that at scale? How can I customize for everybody? Sure. How can I have fairness? Can people pull all this off? You know, it's, it's not easy. And it does require really good management and leadership capability right. and inclusive leadership. Um, we might speak to diversity and inclusion a bit later. But this notion of inclusive leadership is not a box to tick yeah. on your governance sheet. This is really creating a space in which people can come and talk to their boss with ideas, with innovation, with creativity, okay. and about what is important to them. Uh, we are so, um, it's so competitive for talent right now that we don't want any of it walking out the door. Mm -hmm. So that puts a greater accountability on leadership in order to be able to build those relationships okay. of trust. Tell us more about the EVP. The EVP. So we have the organisation. What do we stand for? Yep. Are we competitive? What's our brand? The second part I would describe is the experience. This is the bit that, that I'm most interested in. What's it really like coming to work here every day? Honestly, not, not the marketing speak, not the <laughs> values on the wall. When someone in a job interview asks you about the culture of your organisation, you can translate that very quickly to, will I fit here? Can I thrive here? Will I be included here? Uh, is your organisation truly inclusive? And by that I mean uh, all are welcome and given every opportunity to succeed. Or is it political? Are there cliques, unwritten rules, uh, more social norms of behaviour that, that are a little bit exclusive? Every organisation has politics. It's part of the human condition. <laughs> but it, is it getting in the way? Like having an honest appraisal of that, um, what 
is the leadership and management role modeling in your organization. If, if you are going to be telling a really compelling story to talented people to come and work for you, how aligned is that experience when they walk through the door? And again, to put more onus, uh, onus on the bosses, uh, what does that role modeling of behavior look like? Is it truly inclusive? We've got a lot of work to do in that space in, in developing that capability in our leaders. Now, you also mentioned social purpose. Yes. And you distinguish that from organizational purpose. Yeah, they are linked, uh, absolutely. Um, but it's worth talking about it um, on its own, the, the S in ESG. So I mentioned a statistic earlier, which I find fascinating. We're seeing this particularly with younger generations coming through. What does your organization stand for? Um, in our German business, for example, the traffic on our website that goes from reading our commitment to diversity page to applying for a job with us has uh, increased by tenfold in the last year. People want to know what your organisation stands for. What is your commitment to sustainability and the environment? What is your commitment to diversity, equity and inclusion? Uh, what is your commitment to contributing to the communities in which you operate? And people aren't expecting any organisation to be perfect, but they also aren't expecting a policy to be all that they see. They want meaningful action demonstrated to them. And I've seen people make choices with similar salary packages, similar working conditions, and this piece has edged out that employer ahead of another. So this is real. This is a, a real almost becoming a hygiene factor for, for younger generations. And, and is it a younger generation thing? It, it's not, or, or has mm. it permeated now, frankly, to all employee expectations? I think that's a fantastic question. I think that's, that's where most of the expectation is, yeah. the natural expectation, but I think it's now just part of way. You, you almost have to earn your license to earn a profit now. That's a great line. Tell, tell me something, I'm not just thinking about that, <laughs> gosh. Uh, Tell me something though, the, uh, what you talked about there, it needs to be more than a statement, more than a policy, mm. there needs to be something else to it. What do you mean? So what, you know, sure. to an employer right there who thinks, gosh, I'm really happy to write down my commitment to net zero, my commitment to inclusion, uh, my commitment to the local community, and I, you know, I may have a smattering of things going on, right? Sure. I might be working on a community charity and I may have, you know, done all my recycling and my footprint. Is that enough? I think if it's an authentic commitment and, and some action is being taken, then yes. I think that there's no end point here. You know, we are living in the most extraordinary of times. In fact, I, I love this um, replacement of the acronym that many of you would have heard, VUCA, you know, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous to describe the world of business, which has been replaced with the acronym BANI or BANI, depending on which part of the world you're from. Brittle anxious, uh, non-linear, and wait for it, incomprehensible. This is, <laughs> this is the world we, you know, so buckle up, people. It's exciting, there's lots of challenges, but there's also lots of opportunity. So when we speak to social purpose and we speak to what that really means in terms of meaningful action, we accept that there is no end point, and we're all learning. We have to have the confidence to be able to support each other in that. Um, uh, you know, working, working in this space that I'm particularly passionate about, diversity and inclusion, and working with many male colleagues on this and seeing the confidence drain from them when they start to say, <laughs> I'm not quite sure what I'm allowed to say anymore or do anymore. Yeah. Now, I don't, I don't understand everything either. I understand what it's like to be a woman in senior leadership. I have that lived experience. I don't understand what it's like to be a person of colour in, in that lived experience. But this commitment to opening up, to listening, to being curious and creating safe places where people can talk and listen, I think that's very powerful for people to see. That, that is more meaningful than having a, a policy that you can tick off and maybe yeah. even some targets to achieve. Uh, this is very, very real. And it also speaks to the diversity aspect, if, yep. we, if we can link those two things for a moment which has always been a, we know it's the right thing to do. We know it's the right human thing to do. I think you and I talked about this being a justice thing to do. 
but we are really short of skills. And we are really short of talent. So in addition to it being absolutely the right thing to do, it's a business imperative. Uh, my CEO now describes diversity, equity, inclusion in our own business as a business critical top three item. Uh, we need to get to the best ideas in the room. Well, let me ask you then, what, mm. what's the best? Give me some of the examples from clients or people that you've met in your world. Give me some examples of great practice on, uh, on DE&I. Sure. So let's first of all start with an absolute belief it's business critical. Yeah. Right? So let's start with that. And if that isn't happening, uh, and, and I don't mean rhetoric, I mean back to meaningful action, because people joining you will quickly figure that out. Uh, is the mindset, is the belief there, part one? Part two, endorsement from senior leadership, and I mean the CEO. The minute that that happens, things get accelerated. Uh, step three would be get some data and insights about your organisation. If you want to tell a compelling story about your value proposition, make sure people are experiencing that when they walk in the door. Get real about the data and insights from your people about what it's like to work in your organisation uh, and what it's like for people f of, with different characteristics to be part of that. Use those insights to inform what you pay attention to. So in my organisation, we have, is mostly women, but we don't have very good representation at the very top. We have very, very good female representation to about there yeah. and it stops there. So we've set gender targets. There's nothing like setting a target for um, target-driven employees to want to focus their attention. So that's driven change in areas like policy and process, being more transparent when you advertise senior vacancies, setting up networks for people to talk about what it's like to, to work in your organisation and learn from that and go and take action from it. Um, being mindful of the language you use, being more inclusive. When I first arrived in the UK, I don't mind telling you, in my business I heard people use the term man management. Which, this was a decade ago, which really surprised me, because I thought, are there no women being managed in this organisation? <laughs> when I challenged people, I got a you know, roll of the eye, and, and a, you know, she's an HR. Um, <laughs> she's from New Zealand. Uh, wow, so that's a double whammy. I, I got a little bit of that, a double <laughs> whammy. But she sounds Australian. Um, so uh, I think d being aware of language, and, and, and if we don't understand what that means for someone, having the confidence and courage to go and ask. Yeah. That is where I've seen the most difference. Then around the fringes, all the things, parental leave, family leave, yeah. uh, all of those things that are meaningful to your people. I tell you the phrase I've started to use because the football's been on and I realise I shouldn't be using it. It's not as bad as man management, but I always talk about man marking. Right. Because it's a football phrase. Yeah. But of course, you know, as we've all learned, female football is better than male football. <laughs> uh, let me ask you something just finally. Mm. Uh, whenever you do this discussion, it always feels like this is the, this is the field for the big company. Yeah. The big company with the big HR department, with the big diversity and inclusion officer, with the people who've got the capacity to write the perfect employee value proposition. This is not a small company thing. Sure. No, but, I understand. But that can't be right, right? Because this is a generational change. It's a generational change, number one. Number two, uh, I would suggest to anyone who's not working in a large organisation to reflect on what's in your control. So every organisation has a USP. There's a reason that everyone in this room works for the organisation they work for. And actually taking a minute and stopping and asking yourself, why do I go to this organisation every day? Is a really compelling way to be able to then articulate to people who might be joining you what that looks like. Not everyone wants to work for a large global organisation. We all have our individual career equation. There are huge benefits working for smaller or medium-sized organisations. Um, flatter hierarchies, access to interesting projects, not being niched and siloed, warmer, friendlier environments, um, less travel, perhaps. Uh, seeing the impact of the change of the work that you're doing in a far quicker and more agile way. Large global corporates aren't for everyone. And likewise, with inclusion and diversity and social purpose, what's in your control? It doesn't have to be global in nature. 
It's how can you have a more inclusive human experience for the people coming to work for you so you can tap into the full range of potential that you have at your fingertips. Yeah. We know that that works for sure. Listen, I have to tell you, I speak to hundreds of CEOs a month and I cannot tell you how much this is the number one issue that keeps them up at night. Mm. The number one issue that keeps them up at night is my people, my place, authenticity, transforming ourselves as humans to be better leaders this way. It's the number one issue. You must be talking yeah. a lot of stages and to a lot of clients about it. I think there's a risk of overthinking it too. These are human beings interacting with other human beings trying to do good work and achieve great objectives for an organisation. Uh, I think we can perhaps get a little bit caught up in our own way. Sitting down and having honest, genuine, authentic conversations with your people and understanding regularly, drinking more tea with them or coffee with them regularly and understanding what's important to them is the single greatest thing you can do to engage and retain your people. Sounds simple. Yeah. It's not easy to do, but it's worth doing. Be human. That's the news story, people. Uh, look, we could talk about this all day, couldn't we? And I'm sure uh, if you're anything like the people I talk to every week, we will be talking about this over coffee. But in the meantime, not only a huge thank you to Hayes for supporting the conference, but a big round of applause, please, for Sandra for a wonderful discussion. Thanks, everybody.